Thank you, everyone. Um, there are a lot of people who have great interest invested in uh, making sure the uh, Arab Spring turns into a really ugly winter. Some of them were at hard work yesterday in uh, Port Said during the uh, football game. Uh, you've probably all heard about it. 74 people died as they were stampeded on their way out uh, of the stadium. Uh, it appears that uh, involved in this were remnants of the former regime of Hosni Mubarak, thugs who entered the stadium with weapons and knives uh, in order to create the precise chaos that Hosni Mubarak often warned would erupt if he left power. Uh, I have no evidence of this. I, I was in Lund last night when it all took place, but um, there is uh, plenty of evidence that uh, this didn't just happen like that because the, uh, the home team in Port Said actually won the game, which is extremely unusual, against Al Ahli, which is the uh, biggest and most successful team in Egypt. So there was celebration and happiness. And uh, why this happened, we do not know. Uh, so lots of people have uh, an interest in uh, the uh, thirst for democracy turning into something else. Many are also gloating now that uh, uh, things have turned bad, and they accuse journalists like myself of having been naive, or even worse, they tell us, you chose to close your eyes to the true nature of the Arabs. They don't want democracy. They are authoritarian by nature, Islamist, probably fascist by nature. And this is what we see now, tribal infighting in Libya, Salafis, the <coughs> second largest party in Egypt, a bloodbath in Syria, and all they want is to wage war on the West and Israel and cover their own woman, women while they rape foreign women. This is what a lot of people have been telling me. I get lots of emails to that effect. And um, these um, stability-obsessed dictator supporters are gloating now that the revolution has <coughs> turned sour in many places. Uh, the same people who for many years were saying, well, at this point, it is absolutely necessary to put uh, Arab democracy in a straitjacket. It pains us, of course, but imagine what kinds of forces would be unleashed if we stopped supporting the uh, pro-Western autocrats of the region. And this is what the West was doing for a very long time. I always, uh, during this past year, I've always 
uh, been uh, longing for someone to say something to the effect of what Bill Clinton said in November 1998, uh, when he said, I have faith in the American people. Uh, this was when he was being impeached for the uh, Lewinsky affair, and almost every single pundit in Washington, D.C. was certain that he would be punished in the midterm elections. Clinton himself said, I have faith in the American people. They always get it right in the end. Uh, it turned out, of course, he was not punished in those midterm elections. Newt Gingrich was punished uh, at the time. He might still have a chance to be punished. Uh, he said, uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm still waiting to hear someone say that about the Arab people. It's messy now, but I have faith in the Arab people. They'll always, they always get it right in the end. I still haven't heard anyone say that. Um, in Suez, the city by the Suez Canal, do I have to stand this close to the microphone, or can you hear me like this? I can go back yes. and turn it, turn it up if you want to. Uh, yes. we hear you, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. fine. Good. I want to. I want to. Good. Now, but please do that. I will do it. Okay. Yes, <laughs> so, uh, about a month and a half ago, I was in uh, Suez, and I met an ex-activist who was running for parliament. A secular liberal who had been out fighting... Uh, against uh, Mubarak for many years, active in all the democracy movements. And I met him just after the results of the first round of the elections had come out, uh, where we knew that the Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, had uh, uh, got about 40% of the votes, the Salafis around 25%. So I asked this man, who I mean, was obviously not an Islamist, aren't you afraid? of the Salafis and the Islamists in Egypt. And he said, look, the Egyptian people have been closed up, locked up in a dark room for 30 years. Suddenly the doors have opened. They are blinded by sunlight. They fumble and stumble and fall, and they will continue to stumble and fall for a long time. But is there any doubt that it was the right thing to do to open those doors? No, there is no going back. Egypt right now is in a huge mess. We have a situation right now where those who ignited the revolution, the young Facebook freedom fighters, are uh, could be described as a minority squeezed in between the Supreme Military Council, the SCAF, and the Islamists who dominate parliament, uh, whom the young Facebook freedom fighters and the revolutionaries uh, suspect of having made a deal with the military uh, in the name of stability, of course, in order to uh, sit comfortably in, their, uh, in the parliament. The youth of the revolution feel betrayed. If anyone has problems hearing me, just let me know and I'll use another mic. Yes. Yes? But it, it is soft. So try to. Does this sound any better? No. Okay. All right. Um, so the, um, the youth of the revolution, they feel betrayed today. Uh, but they did get a huge boost on January 25th when uh, the turnout for the anniversary of the Egyptian revolution was much higher than expected uh, in terms of how many people were chanting against the military. The Muslim Brotherhood was dis discouraging protests against the military, but they seemed almost outnumbered on Tahrir Square from where I was standing at least, when the protests continued last Tuesday, uh, the day, uh, last Tuesday, I mean last week on um, January, no, Wednesday it was, it was Wednesday, uh, when uh, the um, uh, Brotherhood found themselves in the uneasy position of not really knowing what to say. I mean, this was uh, a day when everybody was questioning would there be celebrations or protests on the square, and it turned out that the protests were larger, louder than the celebrations. 
And this uh, happened once more the day before yesterday when the Brotherhood found itself in a very uneasy position uh, trying to quiet down demonstrations against the ruling military uh, to the effect that there were uh, young Brotherhood supporters preventing demonstrators from reaching uh, the uh, um, parliament and uh, the young protesters started shouting or ch chanting Ashab yurid Scott al ikhwan which means the people want to topple the brotherhood and this has until now been unheard of in the streets of Cairo this is after all the biggest movement in biggest party in parliament but this is what people were saying outside parliament this is still uh, i emphasize a minority uh, the Young revolutionaries are not dominating the scene, and for many months now we've been hearing people say, oh, can't they just go home and let us go on with our lives after all Mubarak has left and the military have said that they are going to uh, hand over power to uh, parliament and, el and uh, an elected president. But the young uh, people who ignited the revolution don't trust the military and they don't... Uh, really trust the Brotherhood either. Now these chants against the Brotherhood the other day were not because the Brotherhood is too uh, Islamic or because the Brotherhood wants to implement restrictions on art and literature, uh, on women and on uh, Copts. These are also worries, but that wasn't the issue. The issue right now is the military. Now, of course, these worries about freedom of expression, about minorities' rights and women uh, in uh, the future, uh, in an Egypt uh, dominated by Islamists, are there and are uh, serious. Um, but before going into these worries, it's worth pointing out that so far, the military council has been the number one criminal when it comes to violations of freedom of expression, uh, they have been raiding and closing down TV stations, implementing censorship, refusing people the right to peacefully protest, as well as violating minorities' rights by insinuating that the Copts are a fifth column in Egypt, accusing them of having attacked the military on 9th of October when the Copts uh, uh, gathered for a huge demonstration and you have probably seen the pictures of how they were uh, run down and killed by the uh, APCs belonging to the military. There's ample video evidence of this. And when it comes to women, I think that perhaps uh, it is all too evident that the military has been uh, beating up women who have been protesting. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the picture of the woman in the blue bra who was being beaten and stripped by soldiers while protesting near, close to Tahrir Square. And she is definitely not the only one. Uh, and I'm sure you've also heard about the uh, disgusting virginity tests that the military performed on young women uh, in the spring and in the summer, uh, the uh, excuse being that, well, these women spent the night in Tahrir Square and now we have arrested them, they will accuse us of raping them, so in order, to, uh, in order for us to prove that we have not raped them, we're going to perform these virginity tests. Extremely humiliating and very few women have come forth to tell their story because of the shame involved in uh, being a woman exposed to this kind of uh, humiliation. Now, uh, the SCAF, the Military Council, has um, uh, obviously made huge mistakes. They have disappointed uh, uh, the, uh, the people. They, they uh, uh, seem to want to cling to power. Now, I don't believe that they do indefinitely want to cling to power, but I'm sure that they want to cling to whatever benefits they have, and those benefits are vast. Uh, they control a large portion of the Egyptian economy. They um, 
uh, I mean, Egypt hasn't been at war since 1973, so uh, as a sort of a bonus, the military has had free hands to control about 15% of the economy with uh, uh, hotels that the military owns. They produce everything from uh, bottled water to washing machines and cars. Uh, and um, neither this budget uh, of their enterprises nor the defense budget is um, open to any kind of scrutiny from the parliament. So this is a, a, a huge uh, issue right now, uh, as well as the fact that uh, many people fear in Egypt that the uh, Muslim Brotherhood has struck a deal with the military uh, in order for them not to be persecuted for any of the deaths that have occurred since Mubarak stepped down, for which, of course, the military is uh, responsible. Uh, this is uh, at stake. Now, in early February, or uh, I, I think it was a, perhaps a week after Mubarak was toppled, uh, I heard about uh, several people who had been tortured by the military, not by the police. I mean, the police, uh, all the crimes the police committed in Egypt are, are very well known and very well documented. But what the military did to protesters in those 18 days of the revolution before Mubarak was toppled, when they brought them to detention centers, uh, was largely unknown or overlooked for a long time. You'll remember that uh, when uh, the tanks came into Tahrir Square, they were greeted by uh, the demonstrators who threw um, oranges and candies at the soldiers in the tanks because they had sided with the revolution. Now a lot of people are saying that they actually never sided with the revolution. What they did was, uh, while the people were saying, we want to topple the regime, the military agreed to topple Mubarak in order to preserve the regime, not to topple the regime, to preserve it and to uh, maintain control over it themselves. So during those 18 days, the military um, arrested a lot of young uh, protesters and tortured them. Uh, during this time, I, I, I think it was a week after uh, Mubarak's toppling, I met an 18-year-old, Mohammed Yahya, who had been tortured by the military and who witnessed uh, uh, and told me exactly what had happened. I published this story on uh, Swedish broadcasting and I told my Egyptian friends about it and every single person I then spoke to said, Ah, uh, no, you must have been misinformed, and you know, this is the counter revolution at work, and uh, the military wouldn't do that because they are on our side. Since then, things have changed dramatically. Uh, and I remember this young uh, boy, 18 year old Mohammed Yahya, saying to me when we had completed the interview, he said, Have you ever heard, I mean, are there any examples in history of a military that gains power and then voluntarily leaves it? <laughs> I must say I couldn't give him any examples uh, of that. So back to the Islamists. The Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, which received now uh, almost 50% of the vote in the final count uh, in Parliament, has kept an extremely low profile in all matters relating to implementing Islamic law, Sharia, limiting freedoms, and so on. And uh, rather than trying to um, impose restrictions on a population which is already uh, largely abiding to Islamic lifestyle, uh, the Brotherhood is now focusing on rebuilding a country that has been mismanaged for 30 years. They don't have any experience, but they do have technocrats, and this is their main focus. They want, uh, of course, to be re-elected. They want to uh, become the success story, the party that managed to put the economy back on its feet after a year of turmoil, uh, 
a period that looks like it's going to be a lot longer than a year, by the way. Uh, they have been very keen to establish uh, good relations with countries like the United States, and they have been behaving in a way that makes a lot of people think of Turkey rather than Iran or Saudi Arabia, whose ghosts, of course, have been hovering over the image of Egypt as well. Now, there have, however, been several alarming statements made by leading Salafists, many of whom, uh, many of these leaders whom I've met myself. Uh, one prominent preacher confessed to me that he really did have a problem seeing churches being built in Egypt, since Christians worship three gods, while we know that there is only one god, he told me. And, um, other Salafis have been making uh, outrageous statements as well. Uh, one uh, advocated covering all the pharaonic statues, especially the naked ones, of course, uh, because they were improper and uh, a result of uh, un-Islamic or pre-Islamic idolatry. You must be kidding, right? Said the TV presenter interviewing him on air. But no. What he suggested as a compromise, if tourists insist on looking at these uh, uh, pre-Islamic pharaonic statues, was that they would at least be covered in wax. <laughs> this is no joke, uh, and the no joke um, rhetoric was also the bottom line of a very unusual Mickey Mouse trial in Egypt recently. A picture on Twitter of Mickey and Minnie uh, dressed as Salafis turned into a court case against a prominent Coptic businessman and founder of the Liberal Party. His name is Nagib Sawiris. He had retweeted a picture uh, as a joke, and he apologized for it because it caused lots of protests and hurt feelings. Uh, but this picture. Uh, which, uh, in which you see Mickey Mouse uh, dressed as a Salafi with a long beard and a Shafiya <coughs> head uh, dress. Uh, and he looks quite vicious, actually. He doesn't look like the little Mickey Mouse we know. Uh, he has huge eyes and he looks, you know, uh, bloodthirsty. Uh, he's standing beside Minnie Mouse, who is, um, of course, uh, covered in the full face veil niqab with just a slit for her eyes. Uh, what makes her unusual, of course, is that her mouse ears stick out and the, the, the pink bow in, on her forehead on top of the niqab, of course. Uh, so this picture was retweeted by Nagib Sawiris. Uh, he was brought to court by a, a famous Salafist lawyer who is also a member of parliament, uh, and the uh, Salafist lawyer said that this picture would cause civil war in Egypt. Um, I spoke to him uh, after the trial. My question <coughs> to him was very simple. I said, sir, where is your sense of humor? He did not find this amusing. <laughs> What he told me is that humor is not acceptable when it comes to religion. And you do not put a veil on a mouse. <laughs> now, these are, of course, outrageous examples. They exist in Egypt, and uh, uh, they will continue to exist. But they do not dominate uh, the public discourse in any way. And this is not what the biggest Islamist party, the Muslim Brotherhood, is spending time on. When it comes to Salafi supporters, I mean, we, we were all extremely surprised. Uh, all the pundits, all the experts, uh, all the uh, analysts uh, had predicted that the Muslim Brotherhood would receive around 25-30% of the votes. This is what most people were saying. And then they thought that uh, the remnants of the old regime, the old NDP party in new, under new names, would receive a rather large portion of uh, the vote in, for parliament as well, and that the liberals and social democrats would sort of receive the rest, and the Salafis, well, yeah, maybe 5%. 
So the shock, of course, was not the Brotherhood uh, winning all these uh, votes, but the uh, Salafis, the 25%. So uh, I spent uh, quite a number of days trying to find out why people voted for them. And I think uh, the bottom line here is that, well, uh, we voted for them because we know them. They live among us. And they uh, help us, they support us, sometimes financially. Uh, they have charity organizations, although they the Salafi charity organizations were definitely not as well uh, established as the uh, Brotherhoods because the Salafis have only been organized for a very short time. But these are people we know and we trust them and they seem good because, uh, you know, they're religious and uh, they're against corruption and so on. Uh, whereas the uh, nice liberals and the social democrats and uh, all the others on the political scale were largely people who lived in intellectual areas of Cairo and rarely went out into the countryside or to the slums where the Salafis actually live. There is a huge uh, uh, class uh, issue in Egypt and uh, people really don't talk about it. It wasn't talked about during the revolution. Some people, some uh, stinking rich people <coughs> in Egypt were a little bit afraid for a while that these uh, popular protests would start targeting them, but they never did, and they still really haven't. Um, I also met several uh, Salafi voters um, and even a candidate for parliament, a young woman in uh, wearing a full face veil, a niqab, and um, I spoke to her about all the things that we find scary about uh, the Salafis and she said, well, we won't implement Sharia for another five years or so, not until the population is ready for it. Uh, so I said, well, that's good, then uh, tourists can have uh, a beer for another five years and go swimming in bikinis because these are, of course, the issues that uh, most Westerners have been concerned with. She <laughs> laughed at this. Uh, and, you know, didn't really find it uh, uh, a big concern, which most people in Egypt don't. Um, but in the same laughing style, she then told me that, yes, I'm definitely in support of stoning a woman to death if she has had uh, sex outside the marriage. Uh, this was, uh, of course, uh, quite shocking, as well as the fact that this young woman, who was a candidate for the new party, uh, a, a, an accomplished, well-educated, perfect English speaking, uh, she was working as an IT expert in a foreign company in a high position, and uh, very competitive as well. Uh, the fact that she told me that, yes, uh, women are only worth half as much as men uh, when it comes to witnessing in court because women are so emotional and forgetful um, so uh, this is you know the state of uh, the matter and uh, I asked her uh, so do you also forget more than your brother for example or any of your male colleagues and she said, oh, no, no, not me. I have an iron memory. This refers to other women, especially those who have children. You know, they become very emotional. <laughs> I got the same answer, more or less, from one of the Salafi spokespeople. Uh, or not the same answer, but he referred to his wife. I asked him, so why, why is a woman's uh, uh, witness testimony worth only half a man's? And he said the same, you know, they are emotional. And uh, this is a fact. This is a well-established scientific fact, he said. So I asked him, does your wife agree with you when you say so? No, 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 my wife. No women agree with, with me. I have three daughters. None of them agree with me. And his wife was an ophthalmologist. His daughters were studying, you know, law and uh, medicine. No, they never agree with me. So who decided this? I asked him. God? Yes. <laughs> Again, uh, this, I find this quite upsetting. The absolute faith in 
the word of God that cannot be questioned. Uh, but I wouldn't say, again, that this is uh, the sort of mainstream Islamist discourse. The Muslim Brotherhood has now become the mainstream. They used to be the boogeyman who uh, Mubarak would scare the West with, saying that, well, if you abandon me, you know, they're going to come into power, and then what will you have? Now this has happened. Uh, they are there, they are the biggest party, and they are definitely not acting like the Salafis, and they resent the Salafis, and they are embarrassed by the Salafis, but the Salafis have a sort of a, a pin in the butt on the Muslim Brotherhood, so that uh, they will have to um, show their Islamist credentials uh, now and then. Uh, but they are uh, uh, absolutely engaged in uh, other matters, like rebuilding uh, the country. Now, the Arab Spring, as I see it, has forever, despite everything that has happened since, and despite the revolution going sour, has forever changed the image of the Arab, the stereotype image of the Arab, despite all the setbacks. Uh, one friend described it to me in terms of, I had no idea we had this within us. Uh, I had, to such an extent, internalized the image of the passive, dictator-loving, perhaps Islamist, but largely apathetic uh, Arab, that I didn't believe this could happen in Egypt or anywhere else. And it did. I mean, the way she described it uh, made me think of a um, Steven Spielberg horror movie when, uh, I don't remember exactly what happens, but there's some kind of inspector who arrives to a house that's haunted by some kind of Twilight Zone stuff. He walks into the bathroom, looks himself in the mirror, and suddenly his face starts you know, melting and running down into the wash base and down the drain. And then it comes back up again. So this is the kind of change in the self-image uh, of people in the Arab world that the Arab Spring has caused. And I think that this um, is changed forever, whatever happens, and there will always be an option of going back to that feeling of self-security, of empowerment, that people did feel on Tahrir Square during those 18 days where everything was like, uh, like utopia. Uh, people were euphoric and uh, there was a lot of you know, uh, romanticism around the revolution. But this person who was there and who managed to topple the regime will never go back to uh, the apathetic person who feels that there is no use. I mean, we see it now. As we speak, there are uh, protests in Cairo after the massacre uh, in the football stadium yesterday where people uh, want to topple the military regime, despite everything, despite the uh, Brotherhood having uh, the majority of parliament, and despite the fact that we know that the Brotherhood and the military probably struck a deal. Lots has been said about um, social media in uh, the Arab revolutions, and I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, go into that for uh, a long time. I, uh, I do believe that um, uh, Facebook uh, was essential, Twitter and Facebook were essential to mobilize on the 25th of January, and uh, was also essential for information, uh, in the beginning of the revolution. However, the internet did go down and uh, it still continued during those uh, 18 days. But um, I still uh, rather like the story about Hosni Mubarak when he goes to heaven. And he is uh, received in uh, heaven, at heaven's gates, by uh, Anwar Sadat, the previous Egyptian president, and Yasser Arafat, the previous the Palestinian president who were both dead. So they say, ah, Hosni, welcome. So how did you die? 
Uh, were you also shocked by the Islamists, says Anwar Sadat, who was shocked by the Islamists, but they didn't want to shoot you, did they? They liked you. And then Arafat says, so were you poisoned by the Israelis like I was? <laughs> oh, you weren't. They liked you too, the Israelis. <laughs> Mubarak refuses to answer. He uh, looks very grumpy and, you know, tries to get out of answering this question and the whole embarrassing situation. But they keep insisting, so how did you die? Come on, tell us, how did you die? So he looks down at his feet and he says, Facebook. <laughs> now, uh, Twitter uh, and Facebook uh, were important. But what we have seen since, and especially after the elections, uh, I met a lot of, uh, of my blogger friends who said, we have to realize that Tahrir does not represent Egypt. Twitter, the Twitter flow does not represent Egypt. Many of the people on Twitter who tell us what is going on in Egypt uh, or belong to the Facebook freedom <coughs> fighters, the well-educated, uh, upper middle class of Egypt, uh, often secular, liberal, or uh, uh, socialists, and they do not represent uh, the Brotherhood, although the, the, the Brotherhood, of course, uh, is on Twitter as well, as is uh, the military scandal. To return for a moment to those days uh, a year ago when Egypt changed, uh, those days when I saw a man on uh, Tahrir Square uh, carrying a sign that said, I used to be afraid, and then I became Egyptian. Um, it really doesn't happen very often to a journalist that you, know, you have to pinch yourself and say, damn it, this is probably a historic moment I'm witnessing right now. <laughs> But this happened to me on the 25th of January last year. I was following one of the marches, and you know we, we had expected around 200 people, the regular activist crowd that always shows up for these protests that have been mobilized on Facebook, the human rights activists, the anti-Mubarak uh, protesters, and uh, everybody knew for you know a big one, a big demonstration. There were two prominent Facebook pages, April 6th and. We are all Khaled Said, uh, who have been mobilizing uh, for the uh, protest. And um, I asked people, I, I wasn't living in Egypt at the time, so I asked my friends, should I be there? Do you think, you know, is it going to be another one of those? So one of my blogger friends said to me, you never know what the watermelon looks like on the inside until you open it. <laughs> Will it be juicy and red or pale and tasteless? <laughs> so on January 25th, the watermelon was opened and I'm very glad I was there. Uh, I remember following uh, the march uh, around downtown Cairo. We went from a courthouse down to Tahrir Square, down to the Nile, past the television building, where by the way there are demonstrations tonight. Uh, and back, we turned right on uh, in, into Boulat, walking under a bridge. And this is uh, when it, it became evident to me that this is a historic moment. Because the uh, protesters, the chants were echoing under this bridge in Boulat, and they were sh chanting, Wahid ibnim, al-shab al-masri thin, which means one, two, where are the Egyptian people? And then they were urging all these onlookers to join in the protest. At that point, I saw two women uh, with their shopping uh, baskets in the market of Bula. And I saw them talk to each other. They were, you know, veiled, dressed in black, long uh, uh, capes. And uh, I saw them talking to each other, pointing at this demonstration. And suddenly they joined. And they were walking at the back of the, of the, uh, the march. Uh, at that point also, a bus had to stop because uh, the protest, uh, protesters were blocking the streets, so a bus stopped. And I saw the passengers uh, walk up through the aisle to the driver, 
forcing him to open the doors, and then they all filed out and joined the protest. And that's when I realized uh, that the watermelon had been opened, and <coughs> Egypt was in fact ready for this. Lots of people had said so previously, but nobody really took them seriously. Uh, not even after Tunisia. People were saying, oh, those who think that this is going to be, you know, a Berlin Wall in the Arab world, that's only wishful thinking. I said so myself, and I know a lot of people who did say so, but they were uh, secretly hoping, of course, that uh, the wishful thinking would come true. Uh, the, the Egyptian novelist Ala El Aswani said several times, uh, years before uh, January 25th, 2011, that Egypt is in a revolutionary state. Yeah, right, you know, I said when I met him and uh, uh, also listened very politely to his analysis, he was talking about all the strikes that were taking place all over the country and the lack of trust in the security forces. And it did turn out that he was correct. Going back again to last year, uh, the 25th, I believe, was a Tuesday. And uh, for everyone who was there, uh, those days really seem now, uh, you know, we look back upon them uh, as dreams. They become hazy pictures, uh, almost as in a movie. Uh, and I remember Friday the 28th, uh, I was out on the streets with uh, uh, a colleague, the British journalist Robert Fisk, and we witnessed some of the scenes that we felt then these would become, you know, epic paintings that we would see at the Louvre uh, in a number of years. Uh, the Battle of the Bridges where people were uh, pushing forward against uh, armed police who were, you know, shooting. People were being killed on these bridges, but people just pushed forward. And uh, these battle scenes uh, without, uh, you know, horses and uh, uh, and bows and arrows, uh, you could really feel that this is going to be. Uh, these are going to be epic paintings and we found ourselves also walking into a cafe because downtown Cairo was full of tear gas, it was impossible to breathe so we took refuge at Café Rish, a legendary place in downtown Cairo where uh, they claimed the revolution was planned once upon a time in 1952, I mean the first revolution. And uh, we found um, uh, an elite of Egyptian intellectuals seated there, middle-aged men and women who couldn't bear the tear gas. They said, our kids are in the streets, but we have to stay here so that we can breathe. breathe. And they were, by the way, washing their eyes with Coca-Cola, uh, not because they love Coke, but because it's very good against tear gas. And, and for me, this also became you know, uh, an image of uh, this uh, revolution, not being anti-Western or anything, uh, uh, with with the people washing their eyes in, in uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, uh, writers like Ibrahim Abdel Magid and Hala Badr, um, with a completely, you know, devoid of all uh, anti-Western sentiment. And um, uh, those things came, of course, much later. And I remember Robert Fisk saying, wow, this is like walking into a cafe during the Russian Revolution and meeting Dostoevsky. <laughs> <laughs> so during those 18 days on the square and in Cairo, Egypt was in total uh, euphoria. And one of the expressions that I remember I heard more than anything else was, I want, I would like, I demand. This is what uh, young people I spoke to on the square were saying. They would, you know, sort of roll up their sleeves and say, look, I want to rebuild my country, the country that Mubarak destroyed. Uh, because one of the um, perhaps cruelest mechanisms of the Mubarak regime was to create apathy uh, and never demand anything from its citizens, and in return also never expecting the citizens to demand anything back from the state. 
Uh, we don't expect you to perform well at work in the oversized public sector, where you're not really needed anyway, and in return, we're not going to pay you hardly anything. So more than 7 million Egyptians are still employed in the public sector, and this means um, one per uh, 13 in, of the workforce, one out of every 13 Egyptian in working age Egyptians are employed by the public sector. This is a huge number. The sort of normal ratio for other countries is one per 200 employees in the, in the public sector. In Egypt, it's one per 13. And ironically, the largest monument uh, over state bureaucracy in Egypt is right there, smack in the middle of Tahrir Square. It's called Mugamma. It's the place you go for all kinds of permissions and papers, driver's licenses, stamped, stamped documents, and so on. Thousands and thousands of people work there, and they, most of them don't really do anything. They arrive at around 11, and they leave at 2, uh, so that they would have time for all their side jobs, which are necessary in order to survive, to support a family. And everybody knows this. There is you know, a silent agreement. Uh, with the, the state. Uh, women usually don't you know, have uh, side jobs like driving taxis in the afternoon, but they bring their household work to the Mugama. So they sit there you know, sewing, mending clothes, doing parts of their cooking, stringing beans, in the midst of all these dusty files in the Kafkaesque corridors. <laughs> now this is what Egyptians hoped would change with the revolution but most people have not seen any of those changes. One of the slogans of the revolution was Aish Horeya Adala Ektemaiya, which means bread, uh, freedom, social justice. And these three demands haven't been met. And uh, of course, they blame different people for why they haven't. Um, but. Uh, a, a very large portion of this uh, revolution was about dignity, about being treated as a uh, human being rather than uh, a subject that uh, could be stepped upon. And this issue of dignity uh, also made the uh, Syrian regime in the beginning of the Arab Spring uh, believe that uh, they would be the victors uh, because uh, last time people spoke about dignity in the Arab world uh, in recent uh, years was uh, in 2006 when Hezbollah was able to stand up to the Israeli army and people in the Arab world said they brought us dignity. Uh, this uh, took, you know, uh, to, to, to such an extent that uh, the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, became a hero in Egypt every year during Ramadan. Uh, the best dates get a name. They're named after someone, you know, the, the most prominent uh, leader in the Arab world that year and so on. So the best date in 2006 was, of course, called Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, and uh, the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, was applauded for his support of Hezbollah. Uh, for his um, uh, support of the resistance axis in the Middle East. Uh, at that time, I even met Christians in Syria who had pictures of uh, Hassan Nasrallah in their homes, uh, although he is a, uh, obviously a Shia Islamist, because they said he brought us dignity. Uh, Bashar al-Assad became popular uh, because uh, he called the leaders of the pro-Western regimes, the ones sucking up to the United States, leaders like King Abdullah in Jordan, Mubarak in Egypt, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, he called them half men because they were not supporting people against Israel. They weren't supporting the Palestinians, they weren't supporting the Lebanese in southern Lebanon. Half men, which is an insult, uh, of course, in uh, Arabic, nisf rijal. What he misunderstood, Bashar al-Assad, was that the revolution that began a year ago was not about revenge on Israel. It was about the dignity you feel if you are a respected citizen of your own country. Uh, 
what makes you feel uh, proud uh, being included in uh, uh, in the state you live in and not just uh, some kind of loyal subject that the rulers step on. And this is the dignity that made people in Tahrir Square uh, take care of the square. You will remember they were uh, cleaning up, they were sweeping the streets, painting the railings of bridges, they went out and, you know, in this euphoric state, they went out and painted schools, everything, because now this is ours, now we have toppled the regime, they said. When I went to Libya, I met a young man who said, uh, don't you dare litter in my new Libya when one of my Norwegian colleagues threw some kind of garbage in the street. <laughs> Now, of course, uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria is in uh, dire straits, so is Hezbollah, who has not condemned the violence against civilians in Syria. Hamas is in a pickle as well, because uh, they have had their headquarters in uh, Damascus. They have been supported by the Syrians and by Iran, uh, who stands behind uh, Syria, of course. Now Hamas has finally abandoned its uh, headquarters in Damascus, though not publicly announced that. So one of the results of the Arab Spring in a geopolitical context is that it has weakened this so-called axis of resistance, uh, at least the axis of resistance that is tied to Iran. Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, and uh, uh, Hamas. Um, so, what's going on in Syria? Uh, a lot of journalists have not been able to enter, and I haven't been able to enter for a long time. I have just now obtained a visa, so I'll be going there shortly. Uh, and I snuck in last spring, uh, disguised as a drama teacher, because they don't let uh, journalists in. They haven't been letting journalists in. But, uh, so reporting from Syria has been extremely difficult, and uh, what we see now is probably a stalemate that could last uh, for months, probably not for years, but probably a lot more than weeks, where the regime is unraveling, but it's still in place, and it still has not used all its options, all its might, uh, militarily and uh, economically against the population. Um, uh, they are extremely clever at, uh, uh, at uh, antagonizing different ethnic groups against each other. This has always been the best argument for the Syrian regime. We are a country of lots of ethnic minorities. Do you want democracy? Well, look at Iraq. That's what you'll get. People will kill each other, like they, by the way, did in Port Said yesterday. Um, so the Syrian regime still has these options. It is isolated, but uh, it still has uh, a lot to play out against the uh, civilians. And the regime, of course, is feeding on the divisions in the international community. Uh, they know that there will not be any foreign military intervention, and they know that the options the international community and the regional, uh, the countries in the area have, are extremely limited. So they can, without really uh, risking their lives, choose civil war rather than negoti negotiate, uh, negotiate a, a clean exit for Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and um, again, they have not used their army to its full force. Uh, also, I do not believe that the defections we are seeing from the uh, military at this point are enough. There is a trickle of people leaving uh, the, the regime-controlled army and going, uh, taking sides with the free Syrian army, which has become a lot more prominent in the past uh, weeks, past months. Uh, the, the protest movement changing from having been a largely peaceful one to becoming a much more armed resistance against the regime. Um, and of course, uh, Syria is also feeding on the fact that the um, uh, Syrian opposition is very, very uh, 
uh, splintered and uh, that there are uh, uh, there is no unity among the the, the various um, opposition groups now another thing that has changed in the context of the Arab Spring is what the Arab League does and the Arab League has rather surprisingly done a lot more than any other external force when it comes to isolating the Syrian regime, uh, a lot more than the international community. And this has, uh, this has changed the face of uh, the Syrian regime internationally. They are deeply isolated and they cannot claim any longer that uh, things are normal in Damascus as they have been for, for months. But I think also the, the Arab League, in this sense, has reached uh, some, somewhat of a dead end because they don't really have any more uh, options. You isolate the regime, you, you threaten with military intervention, but everybody knows that that's not going to happen. Uh, something that I also find rather troubling is the hypocrisy of some of the states in the uh, Arab League who are suddenly uh, extremely keen on protecting civilians in Syria, while the same Gulf states helped to uh, brutally and violently suppress democratic protests in uh, Bahrain. Um, so Syria uh, is uh, uh, a big, big question mark. No matter uh, what the Security Council does, if Russia comes on board and they uh, opt for uh, uh, demanding Bashar al-Assad's uh, uh, giving over power to, uh, to a vice president, no matter what they do, uh, I think that uh, Syria is going to continue to be quite bloody for uh, probably months, not only weeks, unfortunately. Uh, many people ask why, aren't, why, why is military, international military uh, action impossible? And uh, you, most of you probably know that the challenges are just too big, uh, logistical and operational in a country uh, surrounded by so many neighbors that would be immediately affected. Uh, and also there is uh, the obvious risk of uh, an outside military action actually uniting the Syrians behind the regime because the Syrians have been much more split than the Libyans, for example. And then the Syrian army is stronger than the Libyan army, uh, and the country looks uh, differently. Now, to conclude, I just want to say something about uh, uh, predictability. Uh, Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, um, who's often very sure of himself when he writes about the Middle East. I remember when the Syrian army was forced out of Lebanon after the murder of Rafiq Hariri, and uh, Tom Friedman wrote, ah, oh, this is like seeing camels flying. Something huge is happening here. Uh, and then um, most people in the Middle East were very annoyed because they sort of knew that the hypocrites in the West would very soon pull the rug from underneath all the democracy uh, movements and initiatives uh, when they didn't suit uh, the West's interests, which uh, of course uh, happened uh, uh, shortly after uh, uh, the Syrian uh, retreat from Lebanon when uh, the Palestinians held free elections and uh, the wrong party won. So Tom Friedman isn't very popular in the, in the Middle East. He was in Cairo two weeks ago and was booed when he came to a university in uh, Cairo to give a, a talk. And that was right after having written a column not about camels flying, but elephants flying. <laughs> now, he did conclude with words that uh, perhaps many of my friends in Cairo uh, dislike him, but I found these words unusually humble, and I wholeheartedly subscribe to them, and I'll just read you what he, he wrote in that column. He wrote that someday I would love to create a journalism course based on covering the uprising in Egypt now approaching its first anniversary. This was a few days before January 25th. Lesson number one would be the following. Whenever you see elephants flying, shut up and take notes. <laughs> the Egyptian uprising is the equivalent of elephants flying. No one predicted it, and no one has seen this before. If you didn't see it coming, what makes you think you know where it's going? 
That's why the smartest thing is to just shut up and take notes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Q&A. So if you have any questions, raise your hand and we will be able to ask them. And of course, it is okay to tell your question in Swedish. They are okay for top four and stand for some job in Swedish. So if you have any questions, raise your hand. Man, up there. Ja, ja, jag är medlem i Chip och Gasa och det ligger mig varmt om hjärtat. Jag undrar, tror du att det finns en möjlighet? att en ny regim i Egypten skulle kunna påverka USA att inta en annan hållning gentemot Palestina än vad USA hittills har haft. Jag svarar på svenska då. She will answer in Swedish. Okay. Um, nej, jag tror inte att um, den nya egyptiska regeringen hur mycket folkligt stöd den än har kommer att rubba USAs inställning till Israel och Palestina. Däremot så kommer ju Egypten att sätta sig på tvären när det gäller att vara behjälplig i fråga om Israels politik genom Gaza eller USAs intressen i regionen. Och det har vi redan kunnat se hur man delvis har öppnat gränsen mot Gaza, hur eh, den egyptiska nya regeringen också har bidragit till försoningssamtal mellan Hamas och Fatah. Eh, någonting som USA absolut inte ville skulle ske tidigare. Men nu har, nu är, det har inte gått så himla bra ska jag tillägga. Men, men detta är på gång och det är på initiativ av den nya egyptiska regeringen. Så att, Israel och USA kan inte räkna med längre som man gjorde tidigare när Mubarak satt i makten att Egypten bara följer order. Hur det här sen kommer att förändras är väldigt svårt att säga. I Israel är man naturligtvis livrädd att man nu blir omringad av islamister överallt och ser det som ett existentiellt hot. Men hittills så har det inte inneburit någon förändring i hur man hanterar Gaza eller Västbanken, ockupationen. Israelerna väljer snarare, kan man säga, att bygga murarna högre snarare än att anpassa sig till en ny situation där det finns folkvalda regeringar som man borde prata med. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little about the situation of the minorities, religious and ethnic minorities in Egypt, especially Copts maybe. How, how will the situation uh, continue at all? Well, uh, the, the Copts in Egypt, um, the largest uh, religious minority of course, uh, uh, comprise 10% of uh, the population, perhaps more, and many of them are terrified. Uh, they're terrified because uh, they have always heard from the regime that uh, you better trust us and vote for us because otherwise you'll get the Islamists and they want to kill you all. And what they have seen now, uh, quite similar to the young protest movement, they see how they are squeezed between the Islamist majority in parliament and the military. Both, uh, well, I wouldn't say the Islamists in parliament want to kill the cops, but the, 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 the military certainly has been. Uh, and uh, Salafis have been uh, um, uh, on the rampage in, uh, in several uh, cities in Egypt, burning down churches and uh, 
continuing something that has been going on for a long time. I mean, nothing has really changed dramatically since uh, the revolution for the Coptic mi minority, but they are terrified, and they largely have reason to be. But what we saw before the revolution was quite similar to, to what there is now, and that is that uh, extremist Muslims are more or less free to go and burn down churches or uh, kill Copts without ever being persecuted, or cut the ear of a Coptic man as they did in Upper Egypt. They accused him of having uh, an affair with a Muslim woman, so they went and uh, applied uh, Sharia law. Uh, and the Salafis who did that uh, called the police and said, okay, now we have implemented Sharia, now you can come and arrest him for whatever laws you have. And what happens in these situations is what I find really serious. The government, the judiciary, the regime, uh, now and before the revolution, they do not uh, bring these uh, perpetrators to court. What they do is say, oh, this is sectarian tension, we need to do something about it, so let them sit down and uh, talk to each other, uh, you know, let, uh, let's uh, defuse the tension and try, the, try to make them uh, become friends. And, and this is a very serious, very tragic situation that uh, those who commit crimes against Copts do not go to court. Uh, besides that, of course, uh, there is this uh, Salafi trend uh, where people openly say that there are too many churches in Egypt. Uh, some churches are empty, so we need to reorganize the churches, one Salafi spokesman said to me from the party. And uh, they do not, uh, um, I mean, they deny the Christians their uh, uh, citizen uh, rights. And um, this is what the Christians are demanding, that uh, to be treated as uh, equal citizens, not favored, not, uh, uh, not with any uh, uh, exceptional laws for the Christians, not favored when it comes to building uh, churches in comparison to mosques and so on. But I think that Christians all over the region are very, very worried. And there have been a number of Christian martyrs only this year uh, in these church burnings, <coughs> burnings of churches, and uh, of course the 9th of October when 24 Christians were massacred uh, by the military outside the TV building in central Cairo. Can I have a question up here? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, there are some of, the, um, of us who were at the previous UPF um, lecture heard um, the Israeli ambassador Benny Dayan talk about growing instability in the Sinai area and um, military mobilization and a growing, also a growing security threat from the Egyptian side to the Israeli. And I was wondering what you know about that situation. Well, most of the uh, security uh, um, uh, situation in the Sinai is, um, has to do with disgruntled uh, Bedouins who are against the military uh, in um, uh, Egypt. It doesn't really have anything to do with Israel. But of course there is uh, um, uh, smuggling of arms through the tunnels and these Bedouins uh, have absolutely no loyalties to anybody. So they will buy and sell arms and sell them on to Israel, uh, I mean to the Palestinians through the tunnels. And this has increased definitely since the revolution uh, and can be perceived as a security threat uh, to Israel. But that has, I would say, has more to do with uh, the Israelis um, negotiating with Hamas and with the Palestinians. I mean, the Bedouins of uh, Sinai are not directly threatening uh, Israel in any way. They are only facilitating uh, an arms uh, smuggling. But most of them are uh, not, uh, I mean, they don't really care about Israel, the Bedouins in the Sinai. What they care about is that uh, a around a thousand Bedouin uh, young men are, uh, have been arrested by the Egyptian security forces and are still in prison for lots of 
various reasons, and uh, the state has been confiscating their land in Sinai. So this is what that conflict is really about, not about Israel. Another conflict? Uh, do you think that the Arctic Spring is Interesting question. When I came back from uh, covering uh, the revolution in Egypt uh, to Jordan, where I lived uh, last year, I was saying to all my Jordanian friends, uh, when I met them, you know, coming from Egypt, and they were very interested in what's happening in Egypt, and I said, Oqbal Urdun, which means, uh, you know, uh, I hope Jordan is next. Uh, and um, they were terrified, most of them, and they said, no, 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 no we don't want it here. Uh, because the Jordanian royal family has been extremely clever in, uh, uh, in trying to make people think that whatever protest exists in Jordan doesn't come from the real Jordanians, from the real you know, tribal Bedouin Jordanians, it comes from those uh, nasty Palestinians. Uh, so they have been um, uh, <coughs> rather successful in uh, describing the Palestinians as the troublemakers and the real Jordanians are faithful and loyal to the king and they will benefit from that, of course. Uh, but they were also quite uh, smart in the beginning, whereas the Egyptian police started shooting at people with water cannons, the uh, Jordanian police handed out water bottles to the protesters in the first demonstrations. I think it's inevitable that, that all the countries in the region will be affected by the Arab Spring and by these uh, revolutions because none of them uh, have it in them to really uh, implement any kind of serious reform. And I don't think Jordan uh, does either. Um, but I do think that they, they have handled it in a much more clever way, as has Morocco. I mean, the, the, the monarchies have been much uh, smarter in, in uh, handling their uh, disgruntled populations. Uh, and they have been able to say that, well, look, we are uh, pushing forth with reform and things are changing and many Moroccans and many Jordanians believe so, uh, which also uh, led to uh, the uh, GCC, the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, incorporating Jordan and Morocco. Morocco, you know, is quite far from the Gulf. Uh, in their little uh, uh, nice um, uh, economic uh, community, which became then a rather political anti-revolution uh, uh, corporation uh, council. Any, any more questions? Yeah, okay. um, so speaking of Jordan, what about Algeria? How come Algeria didn't be, seem to be affected by the Arab Spring? How is Algeria different? Is it different? Yeah, well, uh, I, really, I really can't answer that. I'm surprised that Algeria hasn't been affected. And the only explain I, I haven't been there for probably um, 18 years or so. Um, but probably because uh, Algeria is still uh, is still scarred by the, the civil war and many people are terrified of plunging into new bloody uh, uh, internal strife in Algeria uh, and of course the um, uh, the regime has been quite severe in uh, in uh, suppressing all kinds of protests that did take place in the beginning. I and mean, last spring there was uh, something that started looking like uh, uh, the wave going from Tunisia to Algeria. But I really cannot answer that. Why hasn't it taken, uh, why isn't it flying in Algeria? The last question for the evening is for the man. Uh, <clears throat> a very brief one and a little longer one. Uh, you mentioned the cartoonist. You have depicted uh, Mickey and Mimi as, as some kind of cellist. And you said that he was brought to court. I would like to know very much, was he convicted? 
uh, no, he wasn't a cartoonist, by the way. Oh, okay. He had only retweeted this cartoon, okay, okay. and uh, yeah, which is uh, which okay. is uh, okay. to to bring him to court. Well, uh, no, he has not been convicted. I do not expect him to be convicted. But the trial resumes on the on the eleventh of this month. Oh, okay. now the other one was simply uh, the complication that, if I understood correctly, the United States. Uh, have um, invested heavily, a lot of money, to the Egyptian army. Almost, it's not quite, but almost to the level they invested in Israel, which is sort of ironic in extreme. But thereby, the Americans would have a possibility to increase their credibility or ruin it completely by, but I don't know which way would they turn the screw. Should they send more money or should they block the military? It's a lot of guesswork, but it would be fine to know yeah. what you think of it. Well, um, it depends on what kind of faith you have in the current American administration. I mean, Hillary Clinton, at the beginning of the uh, upheaval in Egypt, maintained for several days that the Egyptian regime is stable, and we have faith in Hosni Mubarak. So the credibility isn't enormous. Um, but. Um, when it comes to the military, there are, uh, there is very little known, and a lot, plenty of rumors as to how much the Americans are twisting the arm of Field Marshal Kantawi, how much the Americans are uh, demanding that they stop killing protesters, and how much the Americans are hoping that the military will be the counterforce to the Islamists, and. Uh, uh, a lot of people, uh, I mean, the, the same way we, we suspect that there is a deal between the Brotherhood and uh, the military, many people suspect that the Americans have sort of guaranteed that, well, we will make sure you remain in power if you first topple Mubarak, and then make sure that Egypt doesn't get an Islamist constitution. So make sure that you are the ones who appoint the people in parliament who, who will uh, write the constitution. That did not fly. I mean, they had to back off on that. And the military has had to back off on uh, plenty uh, of these uh, test balloons they have been flying since uh, the revolution. But I really don't know, uh, and nobody knows, what the United States wants to do with the Egyptian military and what they can do with the Egyptian military and to what extent the Egyptian military is pro-Western and to what extent it, within its ranks it has, uh, you know, a majority of uh, Muslim Brotherhood supporters. We really don't know. I think that had to end our list of great I just wanted to tell you guys about next week, we will continue and end our series of lectures concerning the Arab Spring. We will start on Tuesday with the Egyptian journalist uh, Stahar al Nadi. She will show her own movies and pictures from Tahiti Square, and she will tell her, her story of how, how she felt that the re revolution went and where Egypt is going. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll actually have a break <laughs> and we'll uh, show a movie about the Armenian genocide and how uh, pe uh, people mistreated the women and acted almost as sex slaves. That will be held at 6 o'clock at Sol Sarsal. Sahar al Nabi will be here at the same time uh, on next Tuesday. And on Thursday, we have two events. We have one, one event at, at 6 o'clock, that is a Get Active meeting. If you're interested in becoming part of our association, arranging lectures, like this one, this is the idea. Arranging travels, movies, uh, writing in magazines, etc., etc., you can find out. Be there at six, and after that, we will end the series of lectures concerning the Arab Spring with Dr. Naomi Saker talking about what is the possibilities for public service in Arab countries. How will media react and transform up this one? But once again, thank you, Sylvia, and thank you all for coming.